You remember from your Old Testament history that the Jewish nation was taken into Egypt during the days of Joseph and Jacob. And they multiplied down there to the tune of two to three million people. And according to the best chronology that we can arrive at, they were in what we call Egyptian bondage, slavery, for somewhere between 200 and 400 years. The chronology is a little uncertain. Scholars are divided on it a little bit. Nonetheless, for a significant period of time. At the end of that time, or towards the end of it, the people began to cry out to God in their suffering, in their punishment, in their discipline. And they asked the Lord for deliverance. As you know, He raised up a man by the name of Moses to be their deliverer. Moses came down and led them out of Egypt. After God had disciplined the Egyptians by sending a series of ten plagues upon them to soften their hearts. The last of which was the death of the firstborn child in every family. And the Israelite people were released. They went across the Red Sea on dry ground as the waters opened up on either side. And came out into the wilderness of Sinai. Eventually down southward until they came to Mount Sinai where they camped. Moses went up on top of the mountain and received from God two tables of stone containing the Ten Commandments. And then other supplementary legal regulations were given to them. They were camped at Mount Sinai for about a year. And then God began to take them northward to a place called Kadesh Barnea. It was the Lord's intention that His people go directly on in to their promised land. The land of Canaan. Which He had promised Abraham they would eventually have centuries earlier. But when they got to Kadesh Barnea, they sent out twelve spies to spy out the land of Canaan. When those spies came back, ten of them out of the twelve were weak and fearful. And they said, we cannot take this land. We are like grasshoppers compared to the giants over there. And they demonstrated that they did not have any faith or confidence in God to take the land on their behalf. Consequently, he said, they're having been gone on that spy trip 40 days. He said, you will have to wander in this barren Sinaitic Peninsula for the next 40 years. Until the whole younger generation, 20 and under, die out. And then the new generation will be able to go on into the land. And thus they did. Tarrying then under adverse circumstances for the next 40 years. Until the older generation died and were buried in the barren outstretches of Sinai. Finally, under the leadership of Joshua, Moses himself not being permitted to go into the promised land because of a breach of faith on his part, was buried on Mount Nebo, somewhere where no one knows. And Joshua then took over one of the faithful spies and led them on in to the land of Canaan, across the Jordan River into the land of Canaan. 
There they had to encounter some seven pagan tribes who lived in the land. God gave them instructions as to go in and destroy those people. They were pagan. They were people who sacrificed their own children to false gods. They practiced uh, sexual promiscuity as an act of worship. They were as bad as bad can be. And thus the Lord gave a charge that they were to be exterminated. The Israelites actually did not do that completely. And the remnant of those tribes became a thorn in their flesh for years to come. But they went in and conquered the land substantially in three major movements. They cut a swath directly across, separating the south from the north, conquering that central region. Then they turned to the south and conquered it, and then finally to the north and conquered it. After that, God set up a series of judges to judge over them. There were 15 of them. And they judged over Israel in the land of Canaan for about the next 350 years. Then at the end of that time, uh, some significant changes were made. The people began to complain to Samuel that we want a king to be like the nations round about us. We're tired of this system of judges. Give us a king. And so God allowed them to have a king. And later on through one of the prophets, he says, I gave them a king in my anger. And in my wrath, I took him away. The king system of Israel in the Old Testament was a sorry and sad situation for the most part, indeed. The first three kings of the nation of Israel were Saul, David, and Solomon, each of which reigned 40 years. So we have a segment there that we call the United Kingdom, where you had all the 12 tribes united under a series of three kings. When Solomon died... And his son came to the throne. He was a very foolish young man. And he made some decisions that brought about havoc in the nation of Israel. And so the twelve tribes of Israel split. Ten of them set up headquarters in the northern part of the country. At Samaria. The other two tribes set up headquarters in the south at Jerusalem. The ten tribes in the north were called the tribes of Israel. And the two tribes in the south were called the tribes of Judah. Each of them then had its own series of kings. There were 19 kings over the northern kingdom of Israel and every one of them was bad. Not a good word said about any of them. They began to practice idolatry. They set up idols at Bethel and Dan, the uh, southern and northern extremities of their territory. And they went deeply into idolatry until finally God brought the Assyrians against them in 722-721 B.C. And the ten northern tribes substantially were taken into Assyrian captivity. In the south, there were 20 kings, and they reigned uh, from about the year 931 B.C. down until they finally were destroyed in 586 B.C. by the Babylonians, Babylonian captivity. I want to talk to you this morning about one of those southern kings. He was the fourth. Of the twenty. They started out with Rehoboam, Abijah, Asa, and number four, Jehoshaphat. You can read about Jehoshaphat 
in four chapters in the book of Chronicles. There's also some parallel information in the book of Kings as well. But from 2 Chronicles chapter 17, 18, 19, and 20, you can read about the life of this king, Jehoshaphat. He was a king who is given a good report. One of the good kings of the southern king of Judah. It is said in the early portion of his ministry that he did not, listen to me now, he did not go after the doings of Israel. Israel being the northern kingdom, being immersed in idolatry, Jehoshaphat did not go after the doings of Israel. And when he dies, at the age of 60, he is given a good report in a one-passage survey of his administration. But the reality of the matter is, Jehoshaphat, like all of us, had his good points, and he had some weaknesses as well. And so in him, we can see something of our own disposition. We all wished we served God faithfully 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. But we don't. Each of us has our own problems, our own weaknesses upon which we must be constantly working, genuinely and sincerely and rigorously, if we expect to go to heaven. Nobody can rationalize and nobody can say, oh, well, everybody has problems and I have mine and so let's just not worry all that much about them and put everybody sort of on an equal plane. Everybody's not on an equal plane because some people are diligently, rigorously trying to serve God faithfully. And others, quite frankly, are not. And that is a significant difference between the two. Jehoshaphat became king when he was 25 years of age. And he reigned for 35 years. And as we take a look at him this morning, I want to look at both sides of his character. Because each of these is very, very significant. First of all, he was a man who was dedicated to God and who respected the law of Moses. And he recognized that even his people in the southern kingdom had their problems and they were weak. And there was always the temptation to go after idols, which on occasion they did, even in the south. But for the most part, they were strikingly different from the northern kingdom. But there was an occasion that is recorded in this little narrative from 2 Chronicles uh, 17 through 20, that is a commentary on the evangelistic and spiritual qualities of Jehoshaphat. On one occasion, he selected about 16 men. Some of them were Levites, two of them were priests, and some other young men who were princes, who were probably of the royal extended family. And he selected these individuals, and they had a copy of the law. And they made an evangelistic trip throughout the southern kingdom, going from city to city, assembling the people in their various communities, and teaching them the law of God. And that is a gold star on his record. He understood the importance of the law of God. He understood the importance of understanding it, reading it, listening to it. 
and being diligently devoted to it and remaining faithful to it to the very best of an individual's ability. And so that was a significant factor in the success of his administration. But there was another side. During the reign of Jehoshaphat, it was one of the most prosperous times economically in the history of the southern kingdom. And prosperity quite frequently breeds contempt and weakness. As indeed we have observed in our own country. But... They became prosperous and they became weak. One of Jehoshaphat's weaknesses was as the nation became prosperous, he feared that there might be other nations round about that would see that prosperity and want to come in and take what they had, invade them. And so he decided against the counsel of God to form an alliance with the northern kingdom of Israel. Now the northern king of Israel at this particular time was a man whose name was Ahab. And Ahab had a wife who was the most despicable female character of the entire Bible. Her name was Jezebel. And Jezebel was the daughter of a Phoenician king. Phoenicia being the little country on the northwestern border of Palestine. And she was an idolater. So here is a king, a child of God, one of the people of the nation of Israel, who marries outside the faith. A pagan woman. And if there ever was such a thing as a hen-pecked man, I say, if there ever was. <laughs> That's a foolish statement. He was a hen-pecked man. She ruled the roost. And consequently, the northern kingdom went into a deep period of spiritual depression under the administration of Ahab and Jezebel, or maybe we should say Jezebel and Ahab. Well, because, as I said a moment ago, of the prosperity of the nation at that particular time, Jehoshaphat said, well, I think I'll throw in with him. We'll combine our military forces and thus be able to uh, go against Ramoth Gilead, some people from Syria to the north that were trying to invade and take over the territory. That was a bad deal. Bad indeed. And as a consequence of that, Jehoshaphat himself weakened spiritually. Now he had a son whose name was Jehoram. And Jezebel and Ahab had a daughter whose name was Athaliah. And if there was ever a woman that rivaled her mother in wickedness, it certainly was Athaliah. Later on in her history, we read that she had a number of children and she wanted one of them to come to the throne and there were six other boys in the family. And she killed six of her sons. So as to keep there from being any competition to the throne. Well, here's the situation. Jehoshaphat allowed and gave approval to his son, Jehoram, marrying Jezebel's daughter, Athaliah. And that unleashed a series of circumstances that would later bring very serious consequences to the southern kingdom of Judah. 
During this period of time, there were three nations nearby that joined together as allies to make an invasion against the nation of Israel. As a matter of fact, these three nations were distant kinsmen of the Hebrew people. There were the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Edomites, all of which lived either over on the eastern side of the Jordan River or down in the southern area just south of that. The Moabites and the Ammonites were descendants of Lot. You remember Lot who lived in the land of Canaan? He was Abraham's nephew. He lived in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And God destroyed those cities and brought his family out. His wife was turned into a pillar of salt because she disobeyed God and looked back. But he came out and he had an incestuous relationship with two daughters. And out of those relationships came two nations, the Moabites and the Ammonites. Then there were the Edomites. The Edomites were descendants of Esau, the brother of Jacob. And they became perpetual enemies of the nation of Israel. So if I may express it like this, you've got three bands of people, cousins, if you will, of the Jewish people, and they're going to get together and come against the nation. Well, that frightened Jehoshaphat significantly. And even though he had weakened in allowing this marital ally which was going to have serious consequences later on, he still had an honest heart and significantly was devoted to God. When he is threatened with this invasion, he goes to God in prayer. And it's a little prayer of only seven verses. And I want to take a look at it with you for just a few moments this morning. And see what we can learn ourselves as a result of this prayer. I want you to look to Second Chronicles chapter 20, beginning in verse 6. I'm going to divide the prayer into four parts. Let me go ahead and give you a little four-part outline here. And then we'll read the passage and look at some of the little... Rich lessons associated with it. Part number one is in verse number six. And the point I want to consider here is simply this. The reverent disposition that characterized his heart. He had a great love for God. He had a great respect for God. His devotion was deep in spite of his weakness otherwise. And so we'll explore that for a moment. The second phase begins in verse 6, uh, or verse 7 and 8. And it has to do with the fact that as he prays, he rehearses for God the Lord's history in helping his people in the past. It's almost as if he says this, if I may express it this way. Lord, let me remind you. Could I please? Could I remind you of what you've done for us in the past? And since that is the case, could I ask you again to help us out as you did in the past? Thirdly, there is in verse 9 an expression of confidence in God in terms of what the king believes he will do. And we need to learn the lesson, as I'll emphasize momentarily, that if you want your prayers to have punch, to have power, you better believe that God will answer your prayers in some fashion. He may answer them differently from how you anticipate or how you would like for them to be answered. But I'll guarantee you this, He will answer them 
according to your best interest. And for that, you can be absolutely thankful. Even if it's hardship, it'll be in your best interest. And then finally, the prayer concludes with the formal petition for deliverance as well. And then we'll notice what happened as a consequence of the prayer. All right, let me begin and and read down. I have modernized the the translation from the these and the thous and so on and made it where it's more accommodative to the way we speak. I'm going basically on the American Standard Translation where you have the name Jehovah instead of the capital L, capital O-R-D. O Jehovah, the God of our fathers, that goes all the way back to Abraham, You've been our God for a long, long time. Centuries and centuries. Are you not God in heaven? He's not asking that question to have an answer supplied. The way the question is formed expects a positive answer. You are the God in heaven, aren't you? In other words, he's not asking a question. He's really making a confident affirmation of the nature of God. And are you not the ruler over the kingdoms of the nations? Yes, you are. You are, aren't you? You are sovereign God. These little nations out here that are running around fighting one another... They think they're in charge of earthly affairs. They are not. You are. Aren't you, God? Brethren, the passages in the Old Testament that affirm the sovereignty of God internationally to control what's going on on His planet for the implementation of His ultimate best will, those passages are manifold. He rules in the kingdoms of men, Daniel 4.17. He removes kings and sets up kings, Daniel 2.21. On and on, one could go citing those passages. And Jehoshaphat underscores that. And then he says, And in your hand is power and might, so that no one is able to withstand you. What a magnificently reverent, inspiring little paragraph that tells us so much about God. Every word of it is true. And tells us something about the devotion of this king's heart in spite of his weakness in times of economic panic. Then let's notice the second part that I mentioned a moment ago, because this is interesting to me. He begins in verse 7, Did you not, O our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people, Israel, and give it to the seed of Abraham, your friend, forever? That is a thrilling passage. Not only to take account of the fact that God is a friend. He's a friend of those who serve Him. Is He your friend? Or is He a stranger? He is your friend. And then notice, He's your friend forever. Abraham had been dead and buried in a cave for a long, long time. But Jehoshaphat says, He is still your friend. That implies, certainly, that Abraham is still alive. His body's dead, but he, in his spirit, is still alive. And has a friendship with God. Isn't that a sweet passage? Oh, indeed, it is. He says... You drove out the inhabitants of this land 
on behalf of your people Israel, you gave it to the seed of Abraham, your friend, forever. And they dwelt therein and have built a sanctuary here for your name. The word sanctuary there has to do with the temple. David was uh, prepared the material for the temple and Solomon built it. And so the temple was there in the city of Jerusalem. The thing that struck me as I studied this is the fact that Jehoshaphat here goes back and reminds God of all the things in the past that he's... He, he focuses his uh, point of emphasis very narrowly, but he thanks God for these things in the past. I want you to think about for just a moment the way you pray. And I'm not talking about the way you lead a prayer in an assembly when we have to accommodate the group in general. But in your private prayers, how do you pray? For what do you pray? And especially, do you ever in your prayers go back and rehearse some of your own history? And thank God for specific things. Do you ever say, Lord, I remember years ago when so-and-so approached me about the gospel. And they asked me this, have you uh, studied the New Testament? You ever thought about what it means to be lost? And we had that conversation. And he or she led me to the truth. Father, I am so thankful for that. Or what about, I am thankful that I met that nice Christian young man. Or I met that sweet Christian girl. And Father, I believe in your providence you brought us together to establish a good home. And I thank you for all she's done for me over the years. I thank you for that. I thank you for the children you've blessed our home with. There are so many memories that you could thank God for. And I don't think we do that perhaps frequently enough. We're so busy asking Him for the emergency things that we need right now. We're in a tight, we're in a bind, we're in a panic or a fear, and we pray, pray, and we don't go back and just reminisce. Every day, every morning, when I start my prayer, my early morning prayer, I'm out on my walk, I just kick in, first of all, to the thanksgiving gear. And I just start out thanking God. Thank you for this fantastically beautiful day that I'm able to be alive on your earth. And then I, I just go over a lot of things. You'd be surprised at how many times I thank Him for you. Almost without exception, I thank God for this congregation. These wonderful faces upon whom I have looked time and time again from this pulpit. Over almost a half century. And not infrequently I call you by name. And thank you for the friendship you've rendered. So I just... It struck me as he rehearses his past or the nation's past with God. He's not unmindful of the blessings of the past before he gets ready to ask for something in the future. Do you think that's an important point? Boy, I really do. I really do. So then after making that rehearsal of Hebrew history, he then expresses his confidence in the third section here. Listen to it as we read it together. If evil comes upon us, the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we will stand. 
Now that's not where the sentence ends, but I want to put an exclamation point right there for a second. We will stand. I don't care what comes. If it's from the outside, an invading force, or if it's famine or pestilence, disease, sickness, or what, we will stand. Do you make a resolution to God on occasion that I'm going to stand firm in the faith no matter what happens? I know, Lord, that if I live out my life normally, I'm going to have some hardships. All people do. I'm going to lose people. I'm going to have sickness. I'm going to have perhaps financial straits. I'm going to experience hardship. But do you have a firm feet planted on the ground, absolute resolution, I will stand? I don't intend to turn away from the faith. I know too many who've done it. And they are miserable wretches. I do not know of a single soul in my whole life as a Christian. I don't know of a single soul who's fallen away from the faith who's happy. That I know anything about right now. Most of them just fade off out into oblivion and you don't even know what happens to them. But I'll tell you the ones I know of, I know are miserable. It's a cold, hard, devilish world out there. But then he goes on. He gives some specificity to this. We will stand before this house. That's the temple. And he's going to assemble the people in the court of the temple here to join him in this prayer for deliverance from these hostile forces. So he says, we will stand before this house and before thee. For your name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, and you will hear us and save. That's what I was talking about a moment ago about you've got to have confidence in your prayer. James says in James chapter 1 that when you pray, you must believe and not doubt. For if when you pray you are a doubting individual, let not that man think that he will receive anything from the Lord. But he's just like a something tossed to and fro by the surge of the sea. But you must pray in confidence. You must pray in faith. And like I said a moment ago, if it doesn't turn out like you wanted it to, then know whatever happened was for your best. And even through tears, and even through a crushed and broken heart, thank God that He brought you through it. And that your vision is clear enough to see the advantage that you've gained from it. So, that is what He said. Now, quickly... Let's look at the petition down below, and this will rehearse what I said a moment ago. Beginning in verse 10. And now, behold, he's telling God to look, look, the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir. Mount Seir is the headquarters of the Edomites. So, the three bands of distant cousins. Watch this. Whom you would not let Israel invade when they came up out of the land of Egypt. Now that's interesting. God told them to come on into the land of Canaan and destroy all these tribes. But there were three other groups out here on the periphery. And God said, leave them alone. They were not good people. We don't know the plan of God, what was in the mind of God. He said, leave them alone. And so the king here is reminding God, you wouldn't let us destroy them when we came into the land. And now look at what they're doing. They're bothering us. They're about to try to invade us. So we're going to ask you now to take care of them. Let's read it all the way through. Whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned aside from them and destroyed them not. Behold, how they reward us to come and cast us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. O our God, Won't you judge them? 
For we have no power against this great company that comes against us. We don't know what to do. We will just look to you. Have you ever been in a position where you just said to God, God, I don't, I don't know what to do anymore. I've got a problem here that is too big for me. I, I've got to have some help. Please help me. And then watch for the help to come. Now, I've got to close. But I want to give you the concluding footnote on this. If you read through the record, God told him, go down over into the valley and sit down there. You're not going to fight. This is not going to be your battle. This is my battle. That's what God told him. This is going to be my battle. But you go over and sit down and watch. And so here come these three bands of marauders to invade the land. The Ammonites and the Moabites team up. And go after the Edomites. And they smite them sorely. Well, that's one third of the problem taken care of. What then happens? Amazingly, the Moabites and the Ammonites turn against one another. And like the gingham dog and the calico cat that ate each other up in that poem... They destroyed one another. Prayer answered in a most unlikely manner from the human standpoint. This is a wonderful narrative in the Old Testament that teaches us so very much. I hope you have profited from it and enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed studying it and relating the information to you. Thank you very much this morning for listening, for your wonderful attention.